Back during this winter, a couple of my friends, who I've been doing urbex for a while with, decided to go check out the infamous asylum on the edge of town. For the story's sake, I'll call my friends Steve, Joe, and Rich. We decided to go at night to avoid unwanted attention from the security that patrols the grounds. Driving up to the place, you can truly see what 30 years of abandonment can do to a building. Vines growing up the sides, busted out windows, animals claiming the building is theirs, and of course the graffiti. Steve parked his car behind some brush to remain hidden from the street. We started to walk to the patient housing and treatment building. Only brightened by the moonlight, we could see the beautiful early 1900s architecture of the four-story building. As our group climbed under the joke of a fence, we went to the entrance and put on our respirators. As we opened the old paint chip door, we instantly saw a looming staircase that went to the first floor. Once we climbed the stairs, we noticed that it led to the dormitories, but the staircase kept going up three more floors. I came up with the idea to split into groups of two so we could cover more ground and try to find something cool. So me and Joe, the two youngest of the group, decided we would venture up to the second floor while Steve and Rich would explore the first. We gave each other good lucks and headed up to the second floor. Using our phone's flashlight, me and Joe were able to make out the words, patient treatment and offices on the old metal door. To our surprise, it was unlocked and we found ourselves into a long, never-ending system of hallways. Most of the rooms contained old hydrotherapy bathtubs and showers. We stumbled onto the urbex gold mine. We were so anxious to explore the rest. I noticed Joe stopped walking as if he was listening to something. I said, Joe, what are you... Until I was cut off by Joe shushing me. He then pointed to his ear and pointed below us. I stopped to listen and could make out a faint voice of two men humming. I told Joe, it's probably just Steve and Rich. It was at that moment we both turned our heads to the door that we had entered after hearing the metal door slam shut with force. Steve? Joe said nervously. The only response we got was more of the humming no more than ten yards away. This was our cue to get out of there. We sprinted down two long winding hallways and all the while could hear pounding steps behind us of at least three men. When we got to the end of the hallway I could make out an old fire exit sign with the glow of my light. Me and Joe barely made it to the door and slammed it shut. Through the small busted pane of glass of the door I could make out three dark figures of at least ten feet from the door. We found the stairs and pretty much jumped them all then bursted out the exit. I don't think me and Joe have ever climbed a fence that fast in our lives. We didn't stop running until we got to the car. To our surprise, Steve and Rich were both sitting in the front seats. We screamed for them to unlock the doors and frantically told Steve to drive away. Steve, looking confused, drove away leaving that nightmare of a place behind us. Rich wanted to stop and get coffee. During this time, they told us what they experienced. As me and Joe went upstairs, Steve and Rich entered the dormitory space. They checked out a couple of rooms, but said that they were all empty. So, Steve went to call me to check if we found anything cool, but it went directly to voicemail. So, Steve and Rich figured that we had just left due to the building already being looted and went out to the car. When me and Joe asked if they heard humming... They just looked at us as if though we were crazy. That was the first time I went to that asylum and will most certainly be the last. So this happened almost seven years ago. Me and my friend, named Anna, we were 13 years old. I still vividly remember this incident and I think this is a great lesson for young girls. As most of us young girls back in 2013, we were fans of One Direction. My friend Anna and I went to the cinema to watch the movie This Is Us about One Direction. We were having fun and singing along, so the movie was over at 10pm. My friend called her dad to come and pick us up. 
We knew we had to wait for about 20 minutes before he arrives because both of us live outside of the city. So we were walking around and talking about the movie when we heard some men asking us, Hey girls, need a ride home? And we just kept walking pretending we didn't hear anything. A few moments later, we stopped and waited for her dad in the lighted area because we thought it would be safer that way. Then the same men came again and stopped their car right in front of us. At first, I was irritated to see them again, but then fear kicked in. The guy in the passenger seat said, Come on, girls. Get in the car. We can give you a ride home, or even better, you can go to our place and have some fun. I was shocked hearing that because they looked to be around 30, and we were only 13 and definitely didn't look older than 13. My friend replied, Uh, no, my dad is coming soon. We really don't need a ride from you. Suddenly, one of the guys stepped out of the car and was coming to us. We started shouting to go away and screw off. Then the guy came to me, grabbed my arm around my upper arm. All kinds of things went through my head, like what they will do to us. What if I don't see my family again? All in that instant. I knew I had to do something if I don't want anything bad to happen to us. I managed to squirm out of his grip and we started running. Then finally we saw that her dad is coming and she said it out loud so that they could hear it. After that, they just bolted away, back to the car and drove off. I can only imagine what they would do to us if we had agreed to come with them or if the other guy came out of his car and put us both in the car. That's my story of almost being kidnapped and who knows what else. Always be prepared, girls, and always check your surroundings. When I was going into my fourth year of university, I decided to move out of my student residence building and get an apartment with my friend. It was always a scramble to find a place in the small university town, but we found a small apartment and quickly placed a deposit on it. Brenda and I had been friends since our first year of university. During Frosh Week, she had immediately butted heads with her roommate and spent a lot of time hanging out in my room. I am pretty shy, so honestly it was nice to have made a friend so quickly. There were some red flags. She hated my boyfriend and was also pretty nasty to my friends who would come and visit from home. She also seemed to be fighting with her friends and family back home a lot. Again, I was just happy to have someone to go to meal hall with. So back to us moving in together. The first red flag was when, without consulting me first, she bought a ton of furniture for the house. A new table, chairs, couch, all new kitchen utensils, etc. She then sent me the bill and told me I owed half. My extended family had already offered me lots of hand-me-downs, so I had been planning on bringing those, but I didn't want to start our living arrangement off on a negative tone, so I just paid what she asked. Within a week of moving in together, her boyfriend moved in as well. Right away, I told her that if he was going to live there, he had to pay something in rent. She became very offended and asked why he should have to pay since he was only staying in her room. Things only got worse. They were both very messy people and would leave the kitchen and living room a total mess. They would sleep almost all day and her boyfriend would have a fit if I made too much noise. One time he came out of the room at 5pm and demanded I stop cutting carrots so loudly. It was weird. Things really hit the fan when I reported Brenda's boyfriend's living arrangement to our landlord. I had told her that it could come to that if he didn't pay anything but she continued her defense that he was only living in her room. Our landlord was livid. Apparently he had already suspected the boyfriend was living there and asked her about it and she lied. Not only were they taking advantage of me, but also the landlord, as we didn't pay heat, lights, or water. The first scary thing that happened was when I came home one night and I found the hallway lights leading to my bedroom all wouldn't turn on. It was pitch black. It was late though, so I just walked through the darkness and went to my room. The next morning I opened my door and realized that there were knives leading down the hallway on the floor. Somehow I had missed them. I collected them and immediately went to my roommate who claimed she didn't do it. Later that day when I checked the lights I figured out that all the bulbs had been unscrewed. 
I called my landlord and asked to end my lease. He refused. I would have to create a police report and have her evicted. I don't know why I didn't do that, but I just decided to stay out of the apartment as much as I could. The next incident was worse. In my first year of university, I had dated a very scary and abusive person. He would scream at me constantly, among other things. Our breakup was messy and ended with him threatening to seriously hurt me. Brenda knew this. One night after an evening class, I came home to find three people in our living room. Brenda, her boyfriend, and my ex. I raced into my room and called another friend to come over. Fortunately, my friend Morgan came right away. He was over six feet tall and played on the school basketball team. We hung out for most of the night. I felt much safer and even decided to go to the kitchen to get us some snacks. In the kitchen, I was cornered by my ex, literally cornered. He right away started whispering the most awful things to me. I yelled for Morgan and my ex grabbed my wrist and held on to me until Morgan came around the corner. Morgan escorted my ex out of the apartment. I did go speak to the police, but they said that there wasn't a lot they could do unless he did something to really hurt me. The last incident was almost at the end of the school year. I had been at the library studying for exams. Our apartment was a short walk, maybe five minutes to the school, and there were a lot of students coming and going. I was about a minute's walk from our house when I received a text from an unknown number. It said that one of my friends, listed her by name, had been involved in some sort of altercation and I needed to go to the police station to help her. There were a lot of details and it seemed very real. Right away I asked who it was. They said it was the girl's mother, and gave me her name, etc. I was in panic mode worrying about my friend so I turned and started walking to the station. The town wasn't very big but the police station was a little ways away probably another five to seven minute walk from where I was. It was getting away from where most students live, so there wasn't a lot of people walking around. Again, I was in panic mode and didn't think anything about it. As I got closer, I became aware of a car following very closely behind me. This is when I noticed that there was literally no one around now. The car pulled up near me and the back window rolled down just enough for someone to begin throwing trash at me. I walked quicker and made a turn down a street that was too close for them to take. The car backed up and followed me. They now began speeding towards me and slamming on their brakes. They started flashing their high beams and yelling some pretty nasty remarks out the window. I'd had enough and started to run to the police station. The car ripped up next to me one more time and three guys in hoodies jumped out. I pulled my phone out and started waving it around yelling that I was streaming it online while calling the police. I was really only calling the police. That's when I heard Brenda's voice come from the car. She isn't. This is when it hit me that the text was definitely a fake. When the group heard the 911 operator's voice, they jumped back into the car and took off. I went straight to the police station and reported what happened. No surprise, they said that the group hadn't really done anything and there was nothing they could do except issue a warning. Thankfully, my sister lived about an hour and a half drive away, so I stayed with her for the rest of the semester and just drove to my classes. It was a pain, but I'm quite sure that it was better than whatever Brenda and her boyfriend had in store for me. Back in 2014, I was around 17 to 18 years old and I had been dating this guy for a few years, now an ex for unrelated reasons. We were around each other a lot, to the point where we pretty much lived together, but suddenly one of his friends asked my boyfriend at the time if he wanted to move together into this house his family had provided for him. Both of us studied outside of our hometown, roughly one and a half hours away, and this house happened to be a lot closer to both our schools, so... My boyfriend was very keen on the idea. I was also offered to move into this house with them, but since I had just turned 18, still a full-time student and unemployed, I couldn't afford to move away from my family yet. I could say I partially moved in, as it saved me from a lot of traveling. Three hours traveling a day turned into about one, and I could spend more time being productive. 
The moving became official and the following weeks was dedicated to moving my boyfriend at the time's stuff, buying furniture and items he needed and all anything you need to do when you move. The house was located in a nice, calm neighborhood, had a view over a big field filled with friendly cows. It had three floors where the two bottom floors both were fully decked with a living room, kitchen, and bathroom each, and the top floor had three bedrooms and a bathroom. We lived on the first floor while our friend that we moved in with had a younger brother who moved into the second floor. The third floor was shared with each of our bedrooms. The house was old but relatively nice and had good size to it. Additionally to that, our floor had a sauna which, at least to us, seemed like luxury. After some weeks, we were finally done moving and we decided to host a party to celebrate this new chapter of our lives. Our friend's younger brother on the second floor decided to host a party on the same date. Me and my boyfriend at the time and our friend hosted a closed party, legal drinking age in my country is 18, only inviting our closest friends. We started with a chill drinking game to get the mood going while listening to diverse rock and alternative music. Meanwhile, the guy living on the second floor hosted an open party. It didn't take long before the first problem started to occur. The party upstairs had so many attending they started to come down to our floor to use the bathroom, trying to hang out with us and stealing our drinks. We just started by telling them that this floor was off limits and that they had to go back upstairs. Our friend decided to go up to his younger brother to talk to him about it, but was shocked to see and hear what was happening. People were breaking things, harassing our neighbors, throwing trash into people's gardens. Not very unlike any party with drunk people, but we still thought it was starting to get out of hand. After a little, I had to go up to our bedroom on the third floor to grab a few things. The third floor was filled with people, and I had to get firm and tell them that there was nothing for them to do on the third floor and that they had to leave. Message went pretty much unheard. Suddenly this girl, probably about my age, came up the stairs crying her eyes out walked right past me and entered the second floor guy's bathroom. I decided to follow her and I immediately started to get scared. The room was full of smoke, had a small fire in one of the corners. People were either running out or just sitting there like nothing. A group of people tried to comfort the crying girl and the entire situation started to get bizarre. I ran back down to our party and told my ex and our friend about what I had just witnessed. They both ran up with me coming up backing them and started to throw people out. Even while actively trying to throw people out, people kept trying to enter the room as if though there was nothing going on. We managed to stomp out the fire, open the windows to air out the tightly packed smoke and finally the third floor was empty. We came to the conclusion that this party had to end and we went to the second floor, yelling that we had called the police to scare people away. At this point, we actually hadn't called them, yet. To us, it seemed like the only way we could get our point firmly enough for people to get up and leave. Most people left, not minding it too much, but there was one guy who was extremely unhappy for it. Started to fight our friend and eventually we got him out. Finally, everyone was gone besides a few people that were going to stay there, and we went back down to our own party. We decided to make it into more of a chill evening with games and music more than a party at this point, and even though we were a bit stressed about what had happened so far, we continued the evening like nothing. Suddenly our friend's younger brother came running down, telling us that the guy who didn't want to leave had called a group of people and they were on their way to beat us up. This wasn't just any group of people. They were well known around the nearby towns and had a very sketchy reputation related to drugs and gang activity, and if anyone had enough beef with anyone, they were the people they would contact. We immediately freaked out and called the police. The police didn't seem to care at all and told us that they would eventually send a few cops if they were in the area. Apparently nobody was in the area. As time passed, we called them several times to try and communicate how serious this was and how scared we were. With lack of police response, we decided we had to prepare ourselves for the upcoming events. Me and the two other girls at the party were told to go into the sauna to hide. With us, one of the other girl's boyfriends came to help protect us. The other boys at our party started to gather items they could use to defend themselves. Planks, curtain rods, or any long hard objects was their choice of defense, 
and when ready, they started to station themselves at the various entrances the house had. The few of us who were in the sauna continued to call the police to tell them that we had gone into hiding, some of us were ready for an attack, and that we'd really, really like to get the police here. They finally told us that they were going to send someone for sure after we had called them over 40 times in the last few hours, but it was almost too late. We were sitting in the sauna, freaking out for what seemed like an eternity at this time. Since I was hiding in the sauna, I was not there to witness what went down outside, but being told this over and over from all the different guys, I think I had a good overview of how it went down. Suddenly, a random guy who attended the party earlier came running to the door yelling for help. He kept knocking on the door, ringing the doorbell and yelling. After a little, one of the boys concluded that he was probably chased by the gang coming for us and we had to let him in. As soon as we opened the door, a different person who was out of sight suddenly punched him hard on the face and knocked him down. The gang was already standing there, ready to enter an attack, and around ten people entered the house. They were equipped with knives, brass knuckles, and other various melee weapons and started to fight our boys. While fighting, our boys yelled that the police were on the way. They kept on attacking as if they knew that the police here weren't any good and there was nothing they could do. Finally, sirens could be heard in the distance and the gang decided to leave. As they left, one of them stopped for a moment, telling them that they'll be back and the house will be fully ablaze. The feeling of relief I felt can't be described when familiar faces entered the sauna we were hiding in, telling us that it was over and we could come out of hiding but it was still too early to celebrate it being over. While most of the boys got away with minor injuries and cuts, two of us got sent to the hospital with severe concussions, broken limbs, and potentially internal bleeding. The police apologized for not taking us seriously. They managed to catch a few of the gang people while they were walking away from the scene. We also had the name of the guy who called them and informed the police. We wrapped things up, filed our police report and called our parents to come pick us up. We refused to stay at the house even for one more night. We all camped at one of our friend's houses and tried to calm down with some games and movies there, but it was clear that we all had been very scared of what went down. The two guys who were sent to the hospital both luckily survived and got compensation from the guys who were caught, including the guy who called them. All of the ones that got caught got away with doing social services and paying compensation, but if you ask me, some of them should have gotten stricter punishment. To this day, I still imagine how the scenario could have gone if the police didn't take it seriously in the end. The beatings could have been much more severe, and not to even mention what if they were to find the three helpless girls hiding in the sauna with no way to escape. I'm forever thankful that this didn't end up worse than it did. I'm a 22-year-old female in South End, England. This seems like a good place to share my experience. So for starters, my house is a relatively new build, circa 1960s. My dad bought it from the original owners in the 80s and has been here ever since. When my mom fell pregnant with me, there was no longer enough room, so there was an extension built to the side, mid-90s, and, and it's that newer part that has always felt uncomfortable to me. Also worthy to note is that now, it's just my dad and I living here. He works long, long days, and I do shift work, so it's quite often I'm home alone for long periods of time. As a young child, I remember having vivid nightmares most nights, and I was terrified of sleeping in my room. Not uncommon, I know but my fear was quite specific to certain dolls I had in the loft space above my bedroom. I would see the dolls move, again, product of fear most likely, but was too scared to move them into the loft because I'd hear them scratching around up there. As an adult, I have an interest in the spiritual but mostly try to look at things scientifically. Now my real experiences started a couple of years ago. They happen almost in sequence. The first experience was when I was home alone in my room. I could hear the floorboards outside my room creaking like someone was walking around. I assumed my then boyfriend had come in and was trying to scare me. Not to be a killjoy, I decided to pretend I hadn't heard it and ignored it. 
A few minutes later, I was still hearing it, so I opened my bedroom door to see what was going on, and of course, there was no one. Almost as I opened the door, the creaking stopped. That happened twice more over the next couple of hours. I rang my then boyfriend, who was at home just to make sure, then went downstairs to make sure I didn't have an intruder. Getting into my kitchen, there was a knife on the counter. I know absolutely that it wasn't there before as I had done the washing up earlier in the day and the knife wasn't even one of the items I'd washed. Sensing it was some kind of sign, I kept the knife with me until my dad got home. Roughly a week after, the start was the same as before. Hearing footsteps, no one there. I went downstairs and this time, five of our cupboard doors were wide open. A few days after... My dad is really strict about certain things and ever since I have had a key, it's been drilled into me to double lock the front door when I leave the house. I've never not done it. In this experience, my dad came home from work whilst I was out to find the front door wide open. He was mad at me and I insist that, like always, I lock that door. At this point, I'm beginning to worry we have someone living in the loft or garage or something. I've asked my dad to do checks around the house and of course we don't have anyone else living here. Now I was home alone and on the phone with my mom. We were chatting and I'm sitting in the dining room, the newer part of the house, and she suddenly says, who's there with you? I say no one. She says, no seriously, who's there? I hear a man's voice. I'm completely alone but she's so convinced that she just heard a man talk into the speaker that... She drives to my house straight away and does a check for me. My mom is the last person who would play a prank like that. She would never try to scare me. My then boyfriend is an absolute non-believer. I'm kind of on the fence, always trying to come up with an explanation, but he straight up tells me I'm stupid and shuts me off whenever I told him what's happening. One morning I go to work when he stayed over, leaving him in my house alone. He hears a man's whistling coming from downstairs and naturally assumes it's my dad who came home early. He decides to go downstairs to say hello, still hearing the whistling as he's coming down, and there's no one there. That skeptic of a man left my house immediately. My mom believes about the same amount as I do, so I've kept her up to date. I don't bother telling my dad anything as he's another to brush it off. My brother, who doesn't live with us, is another complete skeptic, so I don't tell him either. My mom decides to tell my brother about it, unbeknownst to me. She always felt anxious and off in this house when she lived here, but never said anything and decided to ask my brother about it when he lived here. My brother has two stories to tell from living here. He lived here up until he was about 15, and since he started school... Most nights he would roll over and face the wall because a pencil on his bed table would rhythmically roll back and forth like someone was pushing it. He never did it any other times and it's something that stuck in his brain as a kid. This is the big one. Hold your horses. This. When I was two and he was ten, we went on a holiday to visit family in Mauritius, getting picked up by a taxi at 6am to go to the airport. My brother woke up at 5 and was getting his things together. He was grabbing some things off of his windowsill and happened to see our neighbor in the garden. He looked up at my brother and smiled and waved. He waved back and thought nothing of it. When the time comes, he's putting his suitcase in the taxi and our neighbor's daughter comes out to wave us off and said, Sorry to tell this before you go, but I thought you should know that my dad died in his sleep about... 11 p.m. And it makes my brother go cold to this day to think about it. He remembers exactly what our neighbor was wearing when he saw him, every detail of his smile and wave. But this man was dead. This happened to me about six years ago. My name is Amanda. I'm a 28-year-old Hispanic female and I was born and raised in Southern California in a town called Paris. It's a small sort of ghetto area, but it was home. We lived in the nicest house in our street, but because of how bad the area got over the years since I was little, 
we had to have a wrought iron fence, bars on all the windows, and two German shepherds just in case. To be honest, my mom and I used to think my dad was way too paranoid. Growing up, I used to walk up and down the streets of my hometown with friends, and even though it wasn't the best area, nothing ever happened that made me feel unsafe until this happened to me. My dad had had enough of living in the ghetto, and my parents had been wanting to move for years. Finally, my dad found a job in Arizona where my uncle lived, so he left Arizona to temporarily live with my uncle to start his job and house search for us while me, my mom, and sisters stayed behind to pack everything in boxes. I only had a couple of months to get everything in order, but when I found time, I wanted to hang out with some friends before I left California. The night this happened, I was planning to hang out with my ex-boyfriend. We'll call him Freddy. We were both kind of broke, so we just grabbed a couple of Arizona iced teas from the gas station and went to hang out at the small park in town. Keep in mind, it was about 8 or 9 at night, and it was very dark. But I had grown up going to the park and been there so many times, I didn't see a problem with it at the time. That was a dumb mistake. When we got there, I decided just in case to leave my wallet in my purse and tuck it under my seat. I thought I was smart, and we grabbed our drinks and started to walk around the big grassy area of the park to talk and show each other funny pictures from our phones. There were some people when we first got there, but not even 15 minutes passed and it seemed like everyone had just vanished. First red flag. We also passed by a suspicious looking guy with his dog sitting at a bench like he was waiting for someone who also whistled when we passed by. Another red flag that I stupidly ignored. Freddy and I ended up sitting on a small hill behind the restroom still continuing our conversation about God knows what, when all of a sudden I heard some footsteps approaching the left of us and that's when everything happened so fast. I remember looking up and seeing four Latino guys with bald heads, and if I had to guess, they all couldn't have been older than 20. One ran up to Freddy and yelled, Hey, where you from, S.A.? Freddy's response was, what, but before the guy could ask again, Freddy just jumped up and ran, while just the one guy chased after him. And yes, he left me there, alone, with the three remaining guys just staring at me. I had never felt more fear in my entire life, so scared that my legs felt too heavy to move and I knew that these guys could catch me. Then the one that looked like he was the youngest approached me with a long knife in his hand and pressed it against my stomach, not hard enough to puncture but enough to hurt. He also kept one hand on my shoulder, I guess to make sure I couldn't or wouldn't think about moving or trying anything. My phone was kind of small at the time and it was so dark that luckily I was able to slip it into my sleeve while they weren't looking so hopefully if I made it out alive I could call 911. Give me everything you got girl, empty your pockets, he said to me. I remember thinking he was trying to convince me and the guys behind him of how tough he wanted to be but wasn't yet. I put both my hands up and said I didn't have anything, I swore. He looked back at the other guys and back at me and that's when I started to cry and sweat and thought, please God, I just want to see my mom again, please. And then he said, pull the stuff out of your pockets now. I pulled my car keys out and a dollar bill and for some reason got either brave or stupid and said, see, like I said, I have nothing. Again, he looked back at his friends who were clearly getting impatient and nervous and that's when it hit me. Oh my god, this is a gang initiation. God help me. Then he said, I know you got a phone, so give it. Again, I put my hands up and told him, I don't have it on me. You can check if you want. Stupid, I know, but I thought if I told him that he would just believe me. He didn't, so he checked my pockets of my sweater and I kept thinking, Oh God, if my phone rings, these guys are definitely going to kill me. Finally, the guy who was chasing Freddy ran back, but no Freddy. I'm guessing that was their signal to get out of there because all of a sudden the guy grabbed my keys and the one dollar bill, gives me a shove, and then they all took off running, scattering in different directions of the park, I'm guessing as planned. Still in shock, I was still alive and had not been stabbed to death, 
or worse. I stood there for a minute or two, looking around to make sure that they were gone. Not knowing what happened to Freddy and angry that he betrayed me and left me, finally I felt like I could move and start running, crying, breathing hard, feeling like I was going to pass out from all the shock. I found a lit area of picnic benches where I sat and all of a sudden I heard Freddy call my name and run to me. I wanted to slap his face, but for some reason I was glad he was alive. Looking back now, I have no idea why I even cared. I pulled out my phone and called the police and called AAA because my keys had been stolen and my mom didn't know where the spare key was. The cops took my statement and I distinctly remember how the cop looked at Freddy in disgust when he heard that he had left me. They never found the guys that did this of course, but the keys were replaceable and the dollar bill was a small cost to pay for my life. I had nightmares for weeks after that night and... I always woke up with a pain in my stomach in the same spot where the guy pushed the knife to me. This was a traumatizing experience that made me a very paranoid person. I have since moved out of California and now live in another state with my husband of four years. I have developed a habit of checking and rechecking the locks on my doors and my car. I'm constantly looking behind me and have had panic attacks because... I always think I'm being followed even though the town I live in now is very safe. Freddy and I didn't talk for years, but he has since apologized to me and admitted to being scared, which to me is a lot for a guy to admit. He now has a family of his own and we have remained friends on Facebook, but don't talk often. What I learned from this experience is to not ignore the red flags and to never ever hang out in parks alone at night. This story is going to sound strange to anyone who isn't spiritual or doesn't believe in demons. I encourage you not to skip the story because maybe you'll learn something from it. And it is a thousand percent true in what we experienced. So be warned now, but I know what many others and myself have experienced. I accidentally exercised some demons from someone. Which is the theatrical term for it, but we call it deliverance at church, usually. And it was terrifying. I just recently figured out what the Holy Spirit can do in my life personally, speaking in tongues, when I'm praying, just me and God, not to a whole room with an interpretation. Miraculous healing and prophecy are the things that I didn't know were true outside of the Bible, too, until I received those gifts for myself. After I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, the demonic dreams that plagued me my whole life changed and then went away. I started casting the demons out in my dreams instead of cowering from them or crying or screaming or other things like that. Thank goodness, because it's not fun to be afraid to go to sleep and being afraid of being awake at the same time. That's sort of symbolic for what I'm about to share. I had a best friend that I was super close with that I met at church. Over time I saw him starting to drift away from the faith and church culture a little bit so I started praying for him from afar. Then it turned into blatant disregard for Jesus and I became devastated. I've never interceded more for someone in my whole life. Long story short, way down the line we were at a church retreat one year and the spiritual atmosphere was tingly, like God's presence was just everywhere. It was crazy. Anyone who has felt this knows what I'm talking about. Expectation was in the air. Two weeks before this retreat, my mentioned friend's sister came up and prophesied to me, Like I said, this probably sounds ridiculous to anyone who doesn't know what God can do to people. That my demonic dreams changing and leaving was a sign that deliverance was part of my calling and that I would be part of deliverances or exorcisms in my life. I was freaked out. No thanks, that's too scary. Two weeks later, here I am at this retreat. I knew God was going to do something big, but I didn't know what it was. The last night, which is always the most spiritually intense in a good way, I walked into the chapel with all the students worshipping and immediately began looking for my friend. I wanted to pray over him. I couldn't find him for the life of me and was afraid he left early since he doesn't participate in this stuff anyway. He was just going to these events to appease his parents. I go to the corner to worship and I open my eyes and four feet in front of me, there he is. 
sitting in the only chair in the room, head rested on his hands, arms rested on his legs, blatantly trying to ignore the electrifying atmosphere. So the setting, the worship is concert level loud as this is happening. I suddenly begin sobbing uncontrollably and feel an intense love in my heart. I open my mouth to start praying from four feet away, but I just can't stop praying in tongues. All of a sudden, through my tears, I see him start beating his head with his fist. Due to the loud music and the focus people had on God, no one noticed this at this point. Then he begins screaming at the top of his lungs, blood-curdling male screams as he keeps messing with his head. I didn't know what to do, so I just kept praying and crying. Suddenly he stands up and starts heading for the door, and I need to pray over him now, but I don't move. I was terrified. A student stops him and begins praying over him. Thank goodness, this bought some time. I watch him, and as this student is praying, his eyes are darting back and forth. He wants to get to the door, so the kid stops praying and doesn't even get a thanks from my friend. His mind is elsewhere, and I approach him. I ask, can I please pray for you? Keep in mind, we were best friends, very buddy-buddy. He says, sure, in the most flat, unamused voice ever. I look into his eyes, although he refuses to make eye contact with me, and see something else behind them. It was otherworldly, and I wish I could explain it further. I put my hand on his shoulder. Laying hands is biblical and whatnot, that's what our church automatically does, and he smacks it off of him. He says, don't touch me. And I remember something a pastor told me once about how once when he was casting out a demon from someone, whenever he touched the person, the person would feel physical pain and burning wherever his hand touched. So I said, okay, I'll just pray then. He stops me again and says, when you're praying, pray to me. What? No, I'm going to pray to God. But I don't respond to that, I just pray. I am literally rambling and can barely even speak because my sobbing only got worse by this point. Then four of his close friends surround him too as we stand there and they lay hands on him and begin praying. He kneels over and bent in half and begins screaming manically. We know what's happening, so we just keep praying. Luckily, the worship music was concert level loud. After about two minutes of him bending over and screaming as we continue praying, he stands up perfectly calm and leaves the chapel. We all just watch as he goes. None of us know what to do or how to acknowledge the situation, so we just walk away and continue to worship. But obviously, I continued praying over what just happened. I had heard demons manifest before from a distance since our church is so spirit-filled and they literally cannot stand the presence of God, but I had never had it happen due to my prayers before. I sadly don't believe that whatever demons he had came out of him that day, but they were fighting and reacting without a doubt. These days my friend and I hardly ever speak, but we recently caught up and he's attending a different church than his family and he's probably better than he's been in years unless he's lying to me. It was a very scary situation, but also gave me more confidence for if that ever happened in the future. After all, his sister did prophesy that that would be part of my calling. I'm a 26-year-old female from Michigan, but I was 20 at the time this took place. I live in a safe town and I was working at Walmart in the next town over, which is an even safer town. I work midnights because I am definitely not a people person. Every day I would go home on my lunch to see my new puppy, who to this day has kept me going through countless problems in my life. Working midnights, there were basically no cars on the road when I was going home on my lunches. I was, when I was four miles from work at a stoplight, that I noticed a car had been behind me for a mile or two. I drive like a grandma and always go to the speed limit so there wasn't a reason for someone to stay behind me with clear open road all over. I keep on my way home, the car is still behind me another mile. I thought okay, that's weird but maybe coincidence. I then had to turn on a side street that only had neighborhoods along either side for about a mile. You guessed it, 
the car turned too. I started to get worried but still brushed it off. Maybe they lived down that street. It was then I turned into my neighborhood I started to lose it when the car was still following me. I turned down my street but didn't pull into my driveway because I didn't want to lead this creeper to my house, so I kept driving and took another way back out of my neighborhood. The car is still following me. Just to be positive, before I called 911, I drove through my neighborhood the same way as before and he followed again. I got back on the main road from the side street and called 911, crying because I was terrified, and explained the situation to them. I headed back towards my work. She asked where I was and I told her the crossroads and lucky me, there was a patrol unit a mile up. She stayed on the phone with me and told me to pull into the 7-Eleven at the crossroads the police were close to. The car pulls in after me too. The dispatcher lady told me to turn my hazards on so the police know which car was which. The car must have seen the police car and tried to leave. Not today, buddy. They stopped him on his way turning out. I just parked in a spot, crying hysterically. An officer comes over and asks if I know Michael Stonebreaker. I say, no, I don't. The officer continues to say that he has a good amount of illicit substances on him and this isn't his first arrest, so he'll be going away for a while. Why did he follow me? What was his motive? The officer also said the creeper said he was following me because he thought I was his friend. Why didn't he pull up to me at the red light that we were stopped at? Why wouldn't he have tried to get my attention somehow? That was a very terrifying experience for me, even if it doesn't sound scary to some of you. This taught me a very valuable lesson though. Please pay attention to your surroundings day or night. Anything can happen anywhere, even in a safe town. Gray and Bruce counties in Ontario, Canada often get rolled into one region referred to as Gray Bruce due to the relative similarity between the terrain and general lack of urbanization anywhere besides the city of Owen Sound, which is roughly in the middle of the region. It's not an area known for any kind of mysterious happenings as it is a pretty sleepy place inhabited mostly by farmers, sweet old ladies, and drug addicted teens. The only notable exception is the Blue Mountains on the far east side where Gray and Simcoe counties meet. This area is a tourist hotspot, but the rest of the region is just your typical boring farm towns where nothing ever happens. This is why when sightings of UFOs in the area started popping up, I just chalked it up to people suffering from cabin fever due to the ongoing pandemic. But as time has progressed... I'm starting to become more and more convinced that something is up there in our skies. The first time I heard any of this was at dinner a few weeks ago. My dad mentioned he had seen some kind of elongated light in the sky the previous night. None of us really thought anything of it, figuring it had just been a meteor since due to the pretty much non-existent light pollution in the area, meteors are very easy to spot. That was the end of it for a few days and I just forgot about it until four or five days later. I'm part of this Facebook group called Weird Stuff You See in Gray and Bruce which is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. People mostly just post pictures of funny bumper stickers they've seen on cars or strange things they've found on the side of the road. Nothing too crazy. However, I started noticing a lot of people who were asking if anyone has seen any strange lights in the sky that pretty much exactly matched the description my dad had given of what he saw. Everyone else had also come to the same conclusion that it was just a meteor shower, but the people who had seen them insisted that the lights didn't move and just seemed to hover there so they couldn't have been meteors. It wasn't until a few days ago when I actually saw the lights myself. I was up late, as I have been ever since this pandemic started, browsing Reddit and watching some YouTube videos when I finally decided it was time to try and get some sleep. I went to the bathroom to brush my teeth and I was about to turn on the lights when I saw them out the window. Two very distinct, elongated lights hovering pretty far apart in the night sky. I walked up to the window and cut my hands around my eyes and pressed against the glass to get a better look. Of course, I don't know what I was hoping to see. All I got was a clearer view of the lights and some of the surrounding stars but no real clue as to what it was. 
Now, anyone who is familiar with this area knows that there is a military base just outside of Mayford. However, I don't think this is the military. The Mayford base isn't some kind of top secret Area 51 type place. It's pretty low security. In fact, its gym facilities are open to the public to use and you can just drive onto the base to go there without even having to pass through any kind of checkpoint. It's primarily a training ground for land vehicles such as tanks and large military trucks, but no aircraft. They do occasionally hold off-site training exercises that do involve some aircraft from Borden, but they are always very open to the public about what they're up to as to not raise any alarm. As you can imagine... It would be kind of concerning to see a bunch of military trucks roll through your town unannounced, so they usually give a few weeks' notice before they start any operations. Because of this, I find it very unlikely that these lights are military helicopters, because if they were, they would likely be all over the local radio stations explaining exactly what they're up to. The other reason I don't think it's military is that these lights don't appear to make any noise. When I saw the lights from the bathroom window, I opened the window a crack to listen and all I heard was silence. If these were helicopters, there should have been the usual thumping of far-off helicopter blades cutting through the air, but there was nothing. Furthermore, I don't know what kind of helicopter would have a light like that. As the days have gone on, more and more people have been reporting sightings of these mysterious lights in the sky on the Facebook group. No one really seems to be taking it that seriously and making jokes about aliens being the next catastrophe of 2020 after the virus. I'm not convinced whether these lights are aliens, however, it doesn't seem to have any kind of logical explanation either. The following story happened when I was about 16 years old and still to this day... I reflect on it from time to time. A bit of background. I live in Australia and I live reasonably close to the Royal National Park where this story takes place. If you aren't familiar with the park, it is a large area over 100 kilometers in space with winding roads and nothing but bushland that are quite fun to drive through. On a night like any other, I was doing just that. I was a passenger in my friend Ash's car and my brother Lucas was with us. It was approximately 1am and we were driving deeper into the park as we had done hundreds of times before. As we came quickly around a bend in the route, we were face to face with a girl standing at the edge of the road close to one of those barriers as we must be near a cliff. She looked to be in her teens. Her age, I couldn't be sure. Though this sounds cliche, I swear she was wearing some kind of white dress and was pale faced. I am an avid horror movie fan, so I understand how all this sounds. Her immediate appearance wasn't what was concerning to us. We had stopped virtually in the middle of the road, and the car headlights were shining directly on her. We became uneasy when the girl didn't blink, flinch, or move a muscle despite facing us directly. I remember wondering why she would be out here standing in the pitch black night. I can't remember if my brother or our friend suggested it, but someone said, should we help her? In that moment, so many questions were racing through my mind. I think I was the first to speak and said no, firmly. As much as I wanted to help, I reasoned with the boys, saying that if she was in trouble and needed help, she would have indicated it by now. I also suggested that it could be a trap used to distract us and someone could be nearby to attack us if we aided her. After what felt like hours, though really it was only a minute, we got out of there. We had to drive past her to continue our route and couldn't do a U-turn or a three-point turn because the road was too narrow. As we drove past her, I was in the back seat and turned my head to watch her. I still get chills when I think about this, but the girl's head turned slowly in sync with the car's movements and watched us drive by. I kept my eyes on her and still she didn't blink or move as the light around her started to dim until she was in the darkness again and I could no longer see her face. Oddly enough, the three of us didn't mention it the next day or for a long time. At least I don't remember having a conversation about it with Lucas. It was only a few years later when I had started to question if I had dreamed it when I asked my brother and our friend if they remembered that night. To my horror and somewhat relief, they did. 
They recalled the details as I had recalled them, so I know it was real. Over the years, I have wondered what became of her. I regret not going to the police, and you may ask why I would even go to the police if she had done nothing wrong. Truth be told, there are no residents that deep in the park, and she was a good hour's walk or so from the nearest highway. So I simply wonder if she was a ghost, a lost catatonic girl who needed help, or maybe she was something more sinister. I have gone back to the park several times since specifically to find the girl or see if there is a common occurrence. I have researched online for any clues as to who she may be. On one drive when searching I said to a friend of mine, Nick, who was happy to come along, that there could be bodies in the bush and no one would ever know. A week after I had said this, the dead body of a man was found a few feet away from the road in the bush by a motorist who had stopped to relieve himself. It was in the news and it makes me wonder how many people are out there in that park, but most of all, I just wonder, who was she? Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And my roommate is sucking my toes. <laughs>